Tonight, as you can see already, it's, it's a little bit different of a flow. We're beginning our new series, Built Different. And what we wanted to do is really talk about how to live a built different lifestyle. It's how God has called us to live. But we didn't wanna just create this series and not hear from you. So what we have done is we've opened up a Q&A and we've sent out that form on our story, on social media, through our different teams. And we kind of turned it over to you, turned the mic over to you and say, what questions do you have? What things do you wanna hear? And we had an influx of responses of different questions that you have because we just said, look, nothing's off the table. And we wanted to hear from you. So even tonight, uh, if you haven't had the opportunity to submit a question, but you have something, it'll be up on the story for you to ask a question and we'll do our best over the next uh, few weeks. And even as we continue out throughout the entire year, as we're developing our series and what we wanna talk about, we wanna seek to answer some of the questions that you guys have. So um, you guys know me, but if you're newer, my name is Luke. I have the privilege of being your youth pastor and it's an honor to serve you. But many of you probably don't know Brennan outside of just leading worship, but I'll let him tell you a little bit about himself, but he's just a brilliant leader. I know he's, he's a small group leader, leads the worship team, uh, amazing friend, and just a really great communicator too. So um, we thought it'd be fun to just kind of go through and answer some of these questions. So why don't you say hi? Hello. He. Hello, What's... brother. Hello, brother. There's Braylon in here. Say, Yeah. Good. Right, thank you, Braylon. <laughs> um, what's up, guys? I feel like I haven't seen you guys in, in so long. It's weird being up here. Weren't you um, just singing auto tune? No, that wasn't. Did he me. preach with the auto tune? When it's Chipotle. Anyway, um, yeah. What's up, guys? Um, my name is Brennan. Obviously, as, as Pastor Luke said, um, I've been at the church for it was just twelve years uh, this past December. Um, so I've thanks. Uh, <laughs> Two people thanks. are happy about yeah. that. You're awesome. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, so I've, I've been through pretty much every ministry in this, uh, at the church, um, up to this point. So through kids, um, through legacy and through college now. Um, so I've kind of been in every stage. Um, and obviously I, I lead worship for legacy. Um, and it's such an honor to be able to do that with you guys. Um, and I guess in life things, I just got engaged. Yeah, that's pretty cool. On Friday. Haley there. To, hang on. This is my first time that this is my first time I've ever said this publicly, okay? To my beautiful fiance. Uh oh. Fiance Knowles. I've been saving it for that. Saving it for that. Cause I was like, that that's so weird. Cause she was my girlfriend for seven years. All right. I don't know what that is, but thanks. Um, but yeah. It's not a real commitment until you're engaged. Oh, yeah, life. yeah. And the ring's cool, so ask her about it. I worked pretty hard on it. It was one of those like little 25 cent yeah. turn it. it was really I got it awesome. right out of the Kroger on Mall Road. So uh, if you guys ever need a ring, the plastic machines at, at a Kroger. But cool, yeah. I think um, Pastor Luke um, kind of put it really well. But um, as we were kind of going through and thinking about uh, what to kind of talk about this week, we just realized that, um, first off, you guys ask absolutely incredible, brilliant questions. Um, so credit to you guys. Um, but we had realized that as we would conversate and have open conversation like this, that we would be able to run off and um, it would turn into this really cool thing. Um, so we just kind of wanted to be able to do that with you guys today with the questions that you guys had asked. Um, so we can probably go ahead and hop right into it. So Let's do it. That's what I'm saying. It's going to be real conversational. Uh, we've got some notes, but we're going to see where this goes. So y'all good? Y'all good? Lead us. Y'all good? So, cool. Cool. We're locked in now. <laughs> um, cool. Uh, the first question is, the Bible says that we are supposed to live set apart from the world, but what does that mean? Can I not watch TV shows slash movies, listen to music, or play video games that aren't explicitly Christian? How you kind of feel about that? Yeah, I mean, I think I hear that question and I would ask, you know, what does being set apart from the world look like? I think being set apart from the world looks like being close to our Heavenly Father. Um, it looks like having purpose, having direction with your life. It's not just a list of don't do these things. That's not Christianity, but you have to really ask yourself, what does living set apart look like? I think it's being close to God. Jesus understood that in Luke chapter two when his parents were looking for him. They said, where, where were you? What were you doing? And he said, I don't understand why you had to question where I was. Did you not know? And he makes this statement that I must be about my father's business. I must be about my father's business. 
Because when you know who you are, you realize that there's a responsibility attached to it. We are called to live a certain way, and it looks like close proximity to the Father. I'll put it like this. Uh, in creation, when God wanted to create things, he spoke, right? Well, God said, let there be light. But when God wanted to create fish specifically, if you can read this in Genesis, he spoke to the sea, let there be an abundance of fish. When God wanted to create trees and plants and vegetation, he spoke to the soil and he spoke to the land and said, let there be vegetation and plants and trees. But when God wanted to create us, human beings, he spoke to himself. He said, let us make man in our own image. So let me ask you this, what happens if you take a fish out of water? It dies. It dies. You guys are brilliant, man. You're welcome, brother. <laughs> what happens when you take a tree out of soil? Okay, now let me ask you this. What happens when you remove us from the presence of God? We, we, there's an element of us, a part of your soul that dies. Your emotional well-being, your mental well-being, your life here on earth. When we're apart from the presence of God, we are now operating in a place where we were never designed to be because we were created and designed for us to have life when we're close to the Father. So the natural environment where we thrive is in the presence of God. That's where life is. So if I say that I'm a follower of Christ, if you're a believer, if you're a Christian, you're a follower of Christ Jesus, if I claim to be a follower of Christ Jesus, meaning I'm claiming to be set apart from the world, but then I leave here and I go womanize women and cheat on my wife and treat people poorly and always just am so angry and cussing people out and I cheat people and I lie. Does that represent Jesus? No, you would look at me and say, you're a hypocrite because you're, you're preaching one thing, you're claiming one thing, but then you're living in a completely different way. So an incorrect way to view God would not be how much can I live in the world or how much sin can I do and still get away with it and still go to heaven. I think that's an incorrect question to ask. I've, now, obviously, we can't always be surrounded by godly people and be in church all the time. We have lives, we have environments at school, work, maybe even your family where you're surrounded by other unbelievers. You know, we go to the mall, go to Kings Island, and we're around people that have a secular worldview. So how are we called to live set apart? So the question isn't how much of my old life can I still partake of and still follow God? The question must become how much closer can I get to Jesus? So not what shouldn't I do, what can't I do now that I'm following God, but how much closer can I get to Jesus? Colossians 3 and verse one says, since then you've been raised with Christ. Watch this. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above not on earthly things. So you have to set your mind and your heart not on worldly things, not on how much can I do and still get away with, but I need to set my mind on how can I be more like God? How can I love better? How can I show grace more? How can I be more honoring and respectful? How can I be more generous? How can I work harder? Those are things that we're setting our minds on that are things above, even really practically. You have to ask yourself, does this thing make me more like Jesus? So let's talk about it. Um, let's talk about alcohol. First of all, if you're underage, consuming alcohol is wrong. It's a sin because it's illegal. So that's, that's number one. Um, what does the Bible say about alcohol? We know that drunkenness is a sin. We know that getting drunk is a sin. Inebriation, where you lose the ability to control yourself, so you're lacking self-control, which is a fruit of the Spirit, and drunkenness, which is a sin. So we know that getting drunk is a sin, but does the Bible explicitly say if you're above age that having a glass of wine or a beer is explicitly wrong? The Bible doesn't explicitly say that, but you have to ask yourself the question, does this make me more like Jesus? Is there an opportunity, is there a chance that my being of age, drinking a glass of wine could cause somebody around me who has a struggle, who has an addiction to alcohol, could my partaking in a glass of wine cause somebody else to stumble? Well, the Bible says that we shouldn't even do that because why? It doesn't make us more like Jesus and it doesn't make the people around us more like Jesus. So you have to ask yourself the question, does it make me more like Jesus? So when I think about music, I think about movies, um, you know, 
Is secular music bad? Well, I love 80s music a lot. When you're working out and you throw on like a little bit of Lionel Richie, like I'm just telling you, it's an amazing experience. (laughs) Is that inherently bad? I don't know. But for me, I've really been convicted about the music that I listen to. I've really only listened to worship music outside of the occasional Lionel Richie or 80s classics when I'm working out or when it's nice outside. But you look at the connection of the music and the, the junk that we're watching on TV with, with this overt sexuality and the music that's talking about drug use and women, degrading women and violence, that's going to affect you. So my question is, does listening to music that's talking about violence, drugs, alcohol, and sex, does that make you more like Jesus? So the question isn't, can I still listen to this music and get away with it and be okay? The question becomes, what am I doing to set my mind on things above? And I think that's how we live set apart. Kind of a a follow-up question to that too, um, because we've kind of talked about it in like personal conversation, but what is a way to find balance in that? You know what I mean? Um, Like without becoming so legalistic that you're like, if it's not this way, it's 100% wrong. Like, what do you, what do you kind of do to practice that? You know what I mean? Yeah, I think it's a good question. Like for me, I get like, I'll talk about music because that's a, that's, that's a true conviction for me. When I'm by myself, all I'm listening to is worship music. But, uh, so if someone's riding in the car with me, I got worship music playing. Now, if somebody wanted to listen to a different kind of music, I'm not going to be like, I'm not allowed to listen to that. Now, if it's vulgar and I'm not going to listen to that, that's just me. I'm just not going to do that. Um, But I think there's balance to it. Uh, I'm not going to force my convictions on somebody else. So just because God's convicted me uh, doesn't mean I'm going to shame or judge you if you don't have that exact conviction. If you can live for Jesus and you're still taking steps to live for him and strive for him, who am I to tell you about what convictions you should have. So uh, I just kind of make that decision for myself. And I think that's what you have to do is, is be okay with the convictions that God has given you. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and jump into this, this second question. How do I love people at school or in my family that don't know God? I'm just gonna ask for a little bit of participation real quick. Uh, raise your hands if you know somebody, whether it's a family member or a friend who does not know God. Cool. So this applies to pretty much all of us. Um, So I think the first thing that you can do um, to love that person is invite them to church. How many of you guys were brought because of an invite? How many of you guys are here because of an invite? Miss Marty Moore, wherever she's at, she's a saint and I'm here because of her, so thank you. Um, But I think the big thing to know is like, it's it's hard to kind of um, build that courage to ask somebody because rejection and no is like the scariest thing ever to some of us. It is to me, I get it, but they can say no a thousand times, but all it takes is one yes, right? And so we come to church and, and we experience God's presence on a weekly basis. You know, God's already moving in, in the house tonight, but really loving somebody is wanting to share that experience with them right? Some of you guys have your best friends here, and there's nothing better than experiencing the presence of Jesus together. Um, And I think, too, that's kind of the friend side of it. Um, And I think that it can apply to your parents, too. But I think the second thing is to honor your parents. And that's hard. Honor your parents. Um, So you guys... I think you need to understand this is like you guys offer a different perspective. I offer a different perspective to my parents. For example, um, both my parents come to the church. Um, My dad is a little less. He attends a little bit less. Um, So I kind of offer a different perspective um, at home. How am I representing Jesus when I was living with my parents? You know what I mean? Because I'm here all the time. I'm serving all the time. How am I representing Jesus to him who's not necessarily in the house all the time? So Ephesians 6, uh, 2 through 3 says, the command says, honor your father and your mother, then everything will be with you. Uh, I skipped over a little bit, but then everything will be well with you and you will live a long life on earth. So God blesses that when you honor your mother and your father, when you represent Jesus well. Um, have, like, we all argue with our parents. We don't always, you know, agree. Um, and we could we say the thing like, mom, you never understand me. Like, you don't understand um, I'm going right. to grow up and leave this town. <laughs> I'm going to get out of here. Where are you? And I'm so sorry. There you go. Y'all don't know that one? Sick. Two people. Thank you, guys. Uh, well, I think in those times, be the one that is understanding. You know what I mean? Be the one that has a cool temperament, that stays collected in those conversations that get really heated because that's what Jesus would do, right? Um, 
And I think to kind of to kind of go along with that is is show grace and show kindness. Um, to think about it, like you might be the only representation of Jesus that they ever have, that they've ever had before. And every person is in a different stage um, of their walk with Jesus. Everybody's in a different spot. Um, and, you know, a lot of people that we know probably haven't even started yet, you know. And our place isn't to judge them. Our place isn't to demonize them or say that they're not good enough, right? Um, so we can't shy away from those things, but our, our purpose is to meet them exactly where they're at. Um, and so be intentional and show genuine interest, just like Jesus, represent Jesus in your homes, at your schools, with your family and your friends. But that's pretty much all I have for, for that one. Um, so kind of hopping into the third question, um, how do we go about defending the Bible without going against its word? That's a really good question. Um, actually, sorry. I'll, I'll retract that. The third question is, how do we approach contradictions in the Bible? For example, one of the Ten Commandments God gave to Moses was to not murder. But later in other stories, God has Moses kill and attack other people. Sorry, upstairs production. That's my <laughs> it fault. scared me. I was like, oh, well, we can talk about that too. I'll just Yeah, no, no, no. That's on me. I think you have to ask the question first, are there contradictions in the Bible? Are there contradictions in the Bible? Because I think your starting place determines your answer to that question. You have to start at a certain place. If I assume that the Bible is full of contradictions, that the Old Testament and the New Testament are at war with each other, and that it's, you know, there's, there's things that are not true in the Bible, if that's my assumption, then whenever I read something in the Bible that I don't understand, my starting place will tell me, well, that's because it's false and that part's not really true. That's if my assumption is if there's contradictions. If my assumption is that the Bible does not contradict itself, that it's the complete truth of God and that there's no contradictions whatsoever, when I read something that I don't understand or that doesn't make sense immediately, I'm gonna be compelled to find the answer. Does that make sense? So your starting place matters. The Bible is inherently true. It's the only source of complete truth. So if that's my starting place, then when I look at the word of God and I see something like that, where it says, thou shalt not kill, but then I don't know if you've ever read the Old Testament, there was a lot of killing. There was a lot. God said, go and leave nobody left alive. Well, where do you put that? Well, let's take a look at it. I'm gonna dive in a little bit. Let's talk about the command, thou shalt not kill. It's actually misinterpreted because of just the English language. You have to look at the original Hebrew and Greek language that the Bible was written in. So the original Greek word and the original Hebrew word for thou shalt not kill wasn't kill, it's thou shalt not murder. So the Hebrew has two words for homicide or for killing, just as English does, harag and ratzah. The command is do not murder, one word, Murder is illegal killing, unjustified killing. But there is another word which is to kill, which is justified or legal killing. That would be, you know, you can kill an animal to eat it. You can kill a human in self-defense. If it said don't kill, then we would have to be pacifists and vegetarians, and I love burgers too much for that, praise God. <laughs> no, yeah. no. But... If my starting place is the Bible's full of contradictions, I never go deeper and actually see the beauty of Scripture is that there are no contradictions. Another thing people will say, well, the Old Testament says don't eat pork. Don't eat, so we can, can we eat pork? Can we not eat pork? That's what the Old Testament says. That's what the Bible says. Well, let's talk about that. Because in the Old Testament, there were different types of laws. There were food laws. So God instituted different food laws for the people because he called the nation of Israel to be a set apart holy nation and that they should live separately from the other countries. So it said you shall not eat uh, uh, pork, uh, different shellfish. So according to those standards, we couldn't eat seafood or a lot of different meats today. But the reason God instituted those food laws was number one, to set them apart from those countries during that specific season of time. And then number two, for cleanliness, because now you realize that there's certain ways that you have to prepare food or else you would contract diseases. So God in his infinite wisdom is actually Actually creating boundaries for protection for them. And in Matthew chapter five, when you see Jesus giving the Sermon on the Mount, he never addresses any civil laws, 
any food laws or any clothing laws or ceremonial laws. He's now talking about moral laws. So it's not that the moral law has ever changed. Jesus actually takes it a step further. He says, you've heard it said, thou shalt not murder. I tell you, if you hate somebody in your heart, you've committed murder. So Jesus came in the New Testament to actually take the Old Testament a bit further. They're not at war with one another. They complement one another. So you have to acknowledge that God is far more concerned about our moral law. Um, so I hope that kind of answers that question there yeah. a little bit. How you guys feeling so far? You guys locked in? You good? I'm good. Good? Everybody good? Sick. Sick. You guys look great. I can barely see you, but you guys look great. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, question number four. How do we go about defending the Bible without going against its word? I think that's tough because you guys really do have a target on your back, especially in this culture. I think there's an attack that if you believe in God or the Bible or Christianity, that you're somehow lacking intelligence. Like, how could you believe that? Like, that's crazy. Like, you must be so dumb to believe in God that you just believe in anything and there's such an attack. I'm reminded what Jesus says, John 15, 18, if the world hates you, just know they hated him first. So if you feel anger, animosity because of your beliefs, they really don't hate you, they hate Jesus. They're really not mad at you, they're mad at God. And believing in the Bible, believing in scriptures and Jesus is the furthest thing from unintelligence, is actually brilliance. Um, Because it's not a debate about knowledge, really. Because I can't prove to you. That's what people will say. Well, prove to me that God is real. Prove to me that the Bible is good. And and I know a lot, I've had conversations with a lot of you. Like, hey, how do I respond when somebody says, prove to me that the Bible's real? Well, I can't prove to you anything. I can't prove to you 100% truth of anything. I can't prove to you that this roof is not going to fall through within the next 10 minutes. And you can't prove that either. You can't prove that the car you're driving home in tonight, the steering wheel's not gonna fall out of it and the wheels aren't gonna come flying off the car. Like, can you prove that? Boy, you're putting a lot of faith in the roof that it's not gonna fall in when you can't prove that the roof isn't gonna fall in and collapse on us. Putting a lot of faith in your car that the wheels are gonna work okay and that the gas level's accurate and that the seatbelt's gonna work. You're putting a lot of faith in things that you can't prove. So just because we can't prove something doesn't mean that we can't have faith. No, 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 no. You don't look for proof, you look for evidence. And here's the difference between the two. What is the evidence? You have to look at the evidence because science even agrees that nothing cannot bring about something. But science would try to teach us that there was nothing And then by no explanation, there was magically these two atoms and then these two atoms that came from nothing collided and exploded into the universe as we know it and created planets and trees and life and that life just kind of knew how to change and we've never seen a monkey turn into a human being because it never happened because it's not true and we've never seen all of these things happen but nothing turned into something and created the brilliance of our bodies, of the world, of the earth, that if the moon was just one degree different, we'd have tsunamis and we would cease to exist. Nothing created that, it was happenstance. And you wanna tell me believing in a brilliant creator's far-fetched? What takes more faith? To believe that there's a creator who spoke life into existence, who intricately designed you, created you for purpose, on purpose. I don't know what takes more faith there. So I'd say the best way to defend God's word, you can't prove it, but you have to look to the evidence. And the evidence of the world around me points to the fact that there is a creator, that there is a God who loves us, that he's brilliant, that he's beautiful, that he's merciful. That's the evidence of my life. So I can tell you the evidence of my life God saved me, God gave me purpose, God gave me vision. So I'll tell you the evidence of my life and hopefully that that evidence can inspire something in you. That's what Jesus says, let your light so shine before others. So I think the best way you can defend God's word is by actually living out God's word. I love what you were saying too about like, isn't it funny that the Bible doesn't say, agree with your mother and your father and, it'll, and you'll live long in the days of your life. No, 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 honor. Yeah. How different would your family be if you went home tonight and honored your mother and your father and like loved them and served them and didn't just do your chores but went above and beyond? How different would your friend circle be 
if you were the one that shut down the gossip and loved people and cared for people? How different would the world around you be when someone's trying to come at you with anger? No, 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 what does the Bible say? A soft answer turns away wrath. And well, you know, that's your opinion. Um, I respect your opinion, but you know, I believe what I believe. I look at the evidence around me. How much different would your world be if we actually lived what the Bible talks about? And that's good, especially like, Everybody's seen those videos on TikToks where they get like heated political debates, you know what I'm talking about? And they just start screaming. Um, you know, y'all know what I'm talking about. You know, the college campuses are crazy. Um, anyway, no, but I guess I guess you kind of touched on it, but I kind of want you to to dig a little bit deeper in that is if somebody is confronted at school or, you know, in an area, because people are bold now, you know, they'll say some pretty, you know. Um, some crazy things, you know, whether it's about Christianity as a whole or about believers or about church, like how, how do you go about keeping that peace, keeping that composure um, in those types of situations? Yeah, it's really hard, man. It's really hard because moral outrage, I think, is the easiest emotion. You know, you can be outraged and so much of even our, our feed is designed to spark a reaction. You know, like, oh my gosh, can you believe that? Did you see that? Oh my God. And like, I think moral outrage is the cheapest emotion, but so many people want to rile people up and get people excited. I, I, what's one of our core values of the church? Don't be a part of the problem, proclaim the solution. You know, So that's my thing is if people want to debate me and get into the weeds of it, I'll have conversations and say, look, I'm really not in the business of like, let's just, let's trade knowledge for knowledge. I really don't really want to do that. And even if you're asking me questions that I don't know the answer on, because I'm human, so I'll say, you know what? I don't know the answer on that. So I'd like to take some time and I'll look at it. No, I want our answer right now. Well, okay, well, I don't know the answer right now. So I'm going to take some time and look at that. And if you feel the other person is just wanting an argument, remove yourself. You don't have to engage that person. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, I love their response to King Nebuchadnezzar when they had people around them, they were accusing them. They were telling King Nebuchadnezzar, these, these Jews whom you've set over the affairs of the province of Babylon have not paid due regard to you, King Nebuchadnezzar. And then the Bible says, in a rage, Nebuchadnezzar went to these young men and started questioning them. And their response to the king, you can read this Daniel chapter four. Their response was, uh, we have no need to answer you in this matter. And I loved that. Because if you're wanting to have a genuine conversation with me, I'll sit down, I'll have a cup of coffee with you and let's talk it out. But if you want to debate, I'm not really in the mood for a debate. I'm I, like, because that's just moral outrage. So if you genuinely have a hunger, and I think that's the difference, I think that's what you're saying. Like the difference of, if you wanna have a conversation, absolutely. You should be able to open up your Bible and answer some questions for your friends. And that's why, again, we've got groups for you to go deeper, but um, we should know the word, not just for us, but we should be ready to give an account whenever anybody asks us about the word too. So I think be studied up, be prayed up. Um, that, and that's what I would do. That's really good, really good. Um, on to our next question, how am I supposed to want to be a Christian when people pretend to be Christians. You got that Bible verse in their bio. All glory be to God. <laughs> yeah. the, the eye black. Y'all know what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, but then they're at the parties on Snap. Yeah. 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 Y'all get it. Y'all know. Maybe you're that person. No, I'm playing. I'm playing. <laughs> I'm playing. I can relate to this because it, it makes me mad. You know, I'm like, yeah, you're misrepresenting Jesus. And I think really that question is like, man, how do you deal with offense? He's like, you should know better. You should, uh, and there's, there's that offense with it. Uh, like y'all ever seen the show Undercover Boss? Anybody ever watch that? <laughs> yes. Me too, girl. Yes. Love Undercover Boss. If you don't know the concept of it, but it's basically the CEO of a company will go undercover and as just like one of their employees and he'll get to see, he or she will get to see the experience of what it looks like on the ground level. Because a lot of times, your CEO, boss, they think they know the company's going a certain way and they've got the vision, they've got the heart of the company. And many times, and it makes for great TV, they'll see the employees just like treat customers horribly. I mean, like trash the place, like, oh, you don't have to do that. And then at the end, it's like, ha ha, I'm the boss. You're fired. And that's usually what happens is like the bad employees will either get written up or fired or let go. And why? Because the CEO or the boss has a vision in their heart and they have a passion and a deep level of care for how the company is portrayed, right? They care about it. They put their blood, sweat, and tears into the company. And when they see somebody misrepresenting their company, it hurts them. It grieves them. 
And I think the same is true with God. When, when people who take on the label, right, because that's what these guys will do. They put on the uniform, they put on their little name tag, but the undercover boss will see, you have the uniform, you have the name tag, but you're not the heart of the company. You don't represent my vision. I think the same is true. A lot of people can throw a little scripture in their bio and call themselves a Christian. You might have the uniform, you might have the name badge, but you don't represent the heart of God. When we live double lives, we don't represent the heart of God. So what do we do when you see people like that? My question is, are you gonna hang your hat on the fact that you had a bad experience with a person? Or are you going to take that bad experience with a person and put that blame on God, on the church? So that's, I think, a lot of times what we see is like what's really common is people say, oh, I'm hurt by the church, I'm hurt by the church. Are you really hurt by the church or did a person hurt you? Are you really hurt by God or did a person misrepresent God to you? So what do we do? What do we do if we're dealing with offense? Ephesians 2 tells us, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ Jesus. He himself is our peace who has made the two groups one destroying the barrier and dividing the wall of hostility. So number one, first and foremost, we have to realize as hurtful as that is to see somebody else treat us poorly or other people poorly, we have to first remember that that was us at one point in time where God saw us and he's created us to be a certain way and we were living in a different way. So it's grace and humility, number one. And then Ephesians four, if you read a couple chapters later in verse two, says our response, if we're offended or hurt or upset, Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. We're gonna get offended, we're gonna get angry, we're gonna get upset or frustrated, but we have to first remember that Jesus himself is our peace. A person might have hurt us, but that person is not Jesus. A person might have hurt us, that person is not the church. So we're gonna have to get rid of and lay down bitterness, anger, offense, rage, and we have to, in humility, receive God's forgiveness and realize that if we've been forgiven greatly, we also are called to forgive freely. Not because people deserve it, not because we condone the behavior, but because if we've been forgiven such a great debt, we ought to forgive freely. That's good, and I know we're getting a little short on time, so I'm gonna take this last question. Even though I'm saved, why do I keep going back to old things over and over again? I ask for forgiveness, but I feel like God won't forgive me. Um, first off, that's a, that's a great question. So whoever asked that, thank you. Um, I know that's, that can be sensitive. Um, but I think the bottom line is, I don't think, I know that the bottom line is when you accept Jesus into your heart, you are forgiven. Um, He doesn't take back. He doesn't withhold his love because that's what makes him so great, right? It's not um, circumstantial. Um, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. But, you know, even Peter, after walking with Jesus for three years, went back to being a fisherman. So we can be saved. We can accept Jesus into our hearts, but we can continue to live on in a life of sin and there are still consequences that, are, that come with living in that pattern. Um, and you start to carry around things like, like shame, like I shouldn't be doing this, I'm, I'm a terrible person, like I'm not a real Christian, but Jesus doesn't love me. All those things, they're real thoughts that you can have. Um, and those things turn into things like anxiety, they turn into things like depression. Um, and I need you to know this, is that everyone messes up, I mess up, Pastor Luke messes up, Definitely. Pastor Marcus messes up. We're human beings. We're people. Um, Sorry, let me. My uh, computer decided to lock up. But like I said, like things like that are going to happen. But what matters more is your response to that. So I personally had a lot of trouble with that concept. Um, I carry around a lot of shame for a pretty long period of my life. Um, But somebody explained it to me um, in a really easy way. So you guys all go to school, um, and they explained it to me as in this concept of shame versus guilt. Shame versus guilt. They're two very different things. So I want you to think there's two different scenarios. One, you're walking through the, um, the hall at school. And you come around the corner and you knock somebody's books out of their hand. What's your response? What's your response? 
You're going to help them pick them up, right? Right? And so when you do that, the next step is not to say, I'm such a terrible person because I knocked their books out of their hand. Wow, I, I'm, I'm terrible. No, it's okay to feel bad. But you go and you say, I'm going to be next, more cautious next time. I'm going to watch myself next time. That's the difference between shame and guilt. Don't carry it with you. You help them pick the books back up, right? You're fine. Just do what you can and prevent it from happening again. And why do we go back to old things? Why do we go back to addictions and habits? Well, a lot of times in reality, um, it's because we're trying to cope with something that maybe we haven't fully addressed. Um, I don't know what that looks like for you, but in, in reality, that's what it is. So so maybe it's something in your past. Maybe it's something that's happening right now in your everyday life, and that's your brain's natural response um, to kind of fill that gap. Um, and I think there's there's a lot of um, natural and supernatural things um, that can help us get through this. And naturally, um, and I'll say this from experience, I have accountability partners in my life, Pastor Luke um, and Dylan. Hello, Dylan. Hi, that's my that's my best buddy. Um, but having an accountability partner that you can trust and that you can be honest with, um, setting personal boundaries for yourself and the people that are around you. So don't be afraid to say, hey man, I'm just not cool with that. I don't like who I am when I'm around you. It's okay to set that boundary. That's healthy for you. You're looking out for yourself, which is okay. Um, creating disciplines. So, you know, working out, eating better, getting better sleep, just taking care of yourself. Basic care of yourself. Clean your room. Clean your room, you know what I mean? Just, just take care of yourself. Um, and if it comes to a place, um, talk to your guardian, talk to your parent, um, and connect with a therapist. Connect with a therapist. I'll say this from personal experience, therapy has changed my life. It is probably one of the greatest things that has ever happened to me, and I know Pastor Luke, you can kind of touch on that too, but um, it really is a great thing. But those are all natural things. But supernaturally, spend time with God. Above all else, before any of those things, spend time with God. Be in church. Surround yourself with godly people, with godly influences. And the thing is, is that there's a peace that, that comes with being in his presence that you can't find on your own, that you can't find in a bottle, that you can't find in the drug of your choice, that you can't find in pornography. There's not going to be any peace in that. And that peace can only come from God. But John 16, 33, and I'll, I'll wrap up. And I'll, I know Pastor Luke, you kind of want to get into something, but John 16, 33 is, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart for I have overcome, overcome the world. So good, man. So good. So good. Yeah. That's it. It really does. I love that you talked about accountability too, because accountability is not babysitting. You know, I'm not, hey, Brennan, how you doing? How you doing? How you doing? How you doing? No, you're coming to me. Say, hey, can we talk? Hey, can we do that? Hey, think about this. And like, that's what I love is I've got, I've got the same thing. I've got people that I'm going to for accountability. But everything that you're talking about is all about how you think about God. We talked about that last week. The most important thing in your walk with Jesus is what you think about God. So I want you to picture this. I want you to picture it's the night before the final plague in Egypt in the Old Testament, before the Israelites are freed, the death angel's about to pass over and there's two, two Jewish people talking. I want you to just get this picture. It's two Jewish people, you know, one says to the other, it's the day before Passover. And he goes, man, are you nervous? That was gonna happen tonight? Other guy says to him, you know, no, I mean, why? Why would I be nervous? Didn't you, you hear what, Moses told us that if we sacrifice the lamb and put the blood over the doorpost and eat the Passover lamb, that the death angel won't visit our house and we won't lose the life of our firstborn son. Like, did you, did you do all those things? Did you follow what Moses and God told us to do? And he's like, well, of course, I'm not dumb. Of course I followed that, but man, aren't you scared? It's, it's you know, the death angel is gonna pass over and man, this is terrifying. So that's the demeanor of the one person, but the other Jewish person says, you know what, bring it on. I trust the promises of God, I'm good. So that night, the angel of death sweeps through the land. Which one of them lost their son? And of course, the answer is neither of them. Neither of them lost their son. 
because death doesn't pass over them based on the intensity or clarity of their faith exercised, but the death angel passed over because of the blood of the lamb. Not because of the intensity or fervency or passion of their faith, but what silences the accuser is the blood of the lamb. And the enemy would love for you to doubt its effectivity. The enemy would love for you to think that, yeah, I know you prayed the prayer because that's what, what, what does the Bible say? You have to look at what the blood of, or what the Bible says, what the word of God says, that if you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is God's only son, the only way to heaven, and confess with your mouth that he's Lord, then in that moment, you're supernaturally saved and it's a covenant. So does God break his promises? If the Bible does not contradict itself, and God does not break his promises, then the covenant of your salvation is secure, regardless of what lie the enemy will try to get you to believe. The enemy will try to get you to believe, ah, you sinned, you must not really be saved. Ah, we're, we're sinners, we're saved by grace, but we won't be made perfect until we once again are reunited with Jesus, whether he comes back, <laughs> look at the world, maybe it's soon, I don't know wasn't the eclipse, so they were wrong, but <laughs> womp womp. <laughs> but there's two voices, right? There's two voices. One voice is the accuser. That's what the Bible calls, God calls the devil. He's the accuser of the brethren. He's lying, taunting you. You're not enough. You've messed up. You've gone too far this time. You should know better. That's one voice. The other voice is God saying, I love you. I love you. 